each other. And that's not uncommon. That's, that happens, right? And when it's especially when you get folks in a body and you desire for that body to go forward, when people have visions and people have desires and people have goals and we begin to put forth positive energy to go in the right direction, one, anytime you have energy, there's friction. That's why you need oil in your motor, right? That's why you fill it up with oil, right? It's very important, all right? I had a guy one time, his engine blew up on his car, and I said, did you check the oil? And he said, the what? And I said, that's a bad sign. I said, did you, did, how do, he said, how do you check it? I said, well, it's not going to end well here, is it, Todd? Huh? Or the young man whose father bought him a Yugo. I remember Yugos. Went down and bought him a brand new Yugo. I think it cost about $25, right? And he was sending him off to Bible college in that Yugo. He left the state of Ohio and he traveled to uh, Crown Point, Indiana. They did not realize that the oil cap had vibrated off. By the time he pulled in, all the oil was out of his Yugo, and that brand new Yugo was sitting there with a blown up motor, right? And so there is friction that comes into life. I don't know how it is for you, but I even find in my own life, when I try to go forward or to push forward to do something in life, uh, both for the Lord and just naturally speaking, if you set out to be a trailblazer, if you set out to do something that others aren't doing, you're going to get pushback. You're going to run into friction. That's life, right? Uh, it's okay. That's, a, that's, that's just part of it. It's part of the process. For the believer, though, who is the symbol of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit in the Bible? What is the symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? One of them. It's oil, right? Who is it that helps us? Who is it that soothes the friction? Who is it that helps brothers and sisters to function in the work of the Lord, to be able to get over things and to deal with things and to handle crisis? We saw in the conclusion of chapter 1 that this church was being reminded that they would face persecution. And they needed to be unified. They needed to come together. And so here in chapter 2, we're really going to be given a lot of direct teaching and information about how do I do that. It's one thing to say to somebody, you should have unity. You should be in one accord. And then it's a whole other thing to say, now let me tell you how to do that. Let me show you this. Let me give you step by step, so to speak, or the, the understanding or the heartbeat or the insight of how do we live that way. We read it just a moment ago, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, uh, fulfill ye my joy that ye be, what? like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. The question is put this way, and the Lord would use the Apostle Paul at times to write this way, and that was to make a question that would cause them to think, and then from that to reflect, right? If Christ has done you any good, if Christ has brought love into your life, if Christ has brought fellowship into your life, if Christ has brought consolation into your life, if Christ has brought compassion into your life, if you've experienced all those things in Christ, then reflect those things. You see, this salvation that we have, that we're directed later on in this chapter to have worked out in our life, it is an effectual salvation. It affected our lives. You're here tonight because you're saved. You're here tonight because you love the Lord. You're here tonight because you've been affected by that. We sing about Jesus. We preach about Jesus. We love the name of Jesus because there's love and there's comfort and there's consolation. Well, how do you help a grieving family but to tell them the words of Jesus? Let not your heart be troubled. Whose words are those? Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we get comfort. That's where we get consolation. We talked about this morning being citizens of heaven and the, the approach that we're to have to life. Now we're going to give the mindset of the citizen. If the Lord has impacted your life, if the Lord has brought comfort, if the Lord has brought love, if you have experienced the mercy of the Lord, then in return, distribute that to those that are around you. It's not that complicated. Who would say in the church in Philippi, and who would say in the church in Greenwood, the Lord has not affected me that way? Nobody. We wouldn't say that. We would say, boy, as she did such a wonderful job singing the truth of that song. I found everything in Christ. What is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What joy do you have and what joy have you experienced in this life? True joy, true satisfaction, but that which you found in Christ. Who was there to comfort you in the midst of your trial? Who was there to pick you up and to carry you through? Who in the midnight hour could you cry out to any time of day and he hear and he be concerned? Who is the high priest who's able to secure us and to help us because he's been touched by our infirmities? But Christ, there's nobody like Christ. And he has affected us. 
And just as that admonition is given in the book of Corinthians, those that have been comforted should then in turn do what? Comfort others. We should reflect that. Do you want to know how I am able to see Christ and the salvation that Christ has brought to you? How am I able to see that? I'm able to see that when you reflect that, when you take those things that have been given to you by Christ and we see them in your life. Do you comfort people? Do you encourage people? Do you exhort people? There's several things here now, for time's sake, just move past them. But one, we're to demonstrate compassion. We're to be sympathetic to others. The Bible says that we're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Bible says in the book of Romans, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Everything about being a citizen of heaven is radically different than the world that we live in. The world that we live in teaches self-promotion, self-gain, self-glory, attention, getting attention, being the, being the center of attention, receiving reward, and being recognized. And yet what I see as a citizen of heaven is that I'm to go low and make much of him. John the Baptist said what? He must increase and I must decrease. It's just a, it's a different thing. We're not setting out to become known. We're setting out to make him known. We're not setting out to show. We're setting out to show him off. It's about him. It's about the Lord. And when the Lord has done that for us, that impacts us and that affects our living and our interaction with others. Remember, we're talking about being like-minded. We're talking about going forward in unity. And they're directed then to reflect the impact that the Lord Jesus has had on their life with comfort, with love. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that you have what? Love for one another. I could give you other references here, and we'll move past this, but boy, how we know this, and this love is an agape love. This is a godlike love. This is a love that gives without expectation. This is a love that gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. This is the love that Christ has demonstrated to us. There's bowels and mercies, which speaks of being moved and being impacted down within so that I, there would be an outpouring in my life to other people, caring when somebody's loved one passes, caring when somebody's child errs, caring when somebody's having problems in their marriage, caring about people's circumstances and situations, hearing that somebody has lost a job and asking yourself, what could I do to help them? Seeing that somebody has a need and saying, what could I do to fill that need? Hearing of loss, hearing of suffering, and not just pushing it off. One of the problems that we have today, I think, in the world is we're so interconnected with people that we're really not connected with. You know more about what happened to somebody out in whatever state there is and we pay attention to that stuff so we can hear about it, but you got a body right here that you're to be so connected to that you actually put yourself in that situation with them and love them and help them. Amen. And I'm good with praying for folks. I'm good with knowing about things. But, hey, here's a gathering this evening of several hundred people who have problems. I caught the tears this week of people in our church who are praying and grieving over adult children and decisions that they're making. I caught the tears this week of those who are widowed and widowers. I caught the tears this week of those who live alone and go into empty homes and have nobody to greet them there. I caught the tears this week of those who have loved ones who have sustained injury and health crisis in their life. You have a body of people all around you who need you to care, who need you to be impacted by that, who need you to invest in that and be interested in it. This is how we're to have a culture as citizens of heaven of being concerned. When you hear that somebody sins, your heart ought to break for that person. There ought not to be gloating or pride or arrogance about that. There ought not to be, I saw that one coming. There ought to be, oh God, help that person, love that person. Let's see that person restored. You see someone erring or struggling, have compassion on that person. Have love for them, a genuine interest, a genuine sincerity in them. Why? Because Christ did for us. That's who Christ is to us. We read the bracelets. Well, we, we don't, I don't, but people do. WWJD, what would Jesus do? I know what Jesus has done. I go to the Bible and I see it. He wants to do something in your life. He wants you to be developed into little, little Christ. He wants you to go through life, a citizen of heaven, demonstrating 
a spirit-filled, spirit-led life that Christ demonstrated for us so that others may see that and be helped by it. And so if there be any help, how many of you would say this evening that Christ has helped you? How many would say this evening you've experienced consolation and comfort and joy and encouragement and the fellowship of the Spirit? Then that's how we're to walk. That's how we're to live. That's who we're to be. We go forward here and look at verse 2 very quickly. Fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That brings joy to the heart of the apostle when God's people function well together. You find out very quickly what you're made of by what brings joy to your life. Can you be joyful when other people are successful? Can you have joy in your heart when other people are doing well? Do you, does it always have to be you? When you see the Lord blessing and the Lord dealing with somebody, the Lord helping somebody, do you think to yourself, why is he doing that for them and not for me? No. We find joy in the Lord working in the lives of others. We find joy in that. And as John said, there's no greater joy than what? Than to hear that my children walk in truth. Well, I'm just as pleased as punch with what the Lord has done around our church. I'm thankful for properties. I'm thankful for structures. But you know what I'm more thankful for? I'm thankful for the mighty work that the Lord is doing in our lives. I'm thankful for marriages where people are experiencing joy. And I'm thankful for homes where children are being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm thankful for young people who are making wise decisions as they na navigate life. I'm thankful for those who go and uh, minister to the community and reach out to folks. I'm thankful to those who have that testimony of the Lord working in their life. This is what brings joy. This is obedience. This is the Lord blessing that. And the Apostle Paul says, in the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit, you bring joy to my life when I hear that you're walking in accord, that God is working in your life. Boy, may it be said for us the same. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. This is our issue, isn't it, at times? We lack humility. We do things for vain glory. Vain glory is to be recognized. Everybody appreciates being recognized. There's nothing wrong with sincerely from a heart of appreciation expressing gratitude to somebody. We ought to do that. The Bible teaches us that we're to render uh, and uh, acknowledge when people are serving God and what they're doing. That's an encouragement to them. But if you are up doing what you're doing because you expect to hear, well, that was great. If in your heart there's that level of pride of look at me and look at what I can do. Look at how, look at, look at what I can, look at my gift and look at my talent. That's vainglory. By the way, that's glory that, that passes. That's not, that's not the right kind. We go glory in our flesh. We glory in the Lord. We want everything to bring glory to Him. And so oftentimes, if we're not careful in our church life, we can develop into that mindset of, hey, look at me and see me and recognize me and acknowledge me. Hey, he didn't acknowledge me. They didn't appreciate this. I did that. Nobody said anything. Hey, he saw it. And who'd you do it for anyhow? My life is Christ, and the purpose that God, Christ brings in my life is others, but I'm doing it for Him. For Him. Not with vanity in our mind, not with vainglory as a desire, but in humility. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. On and on we could see the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Strive not with man without a cause. If you've done thee no harm. So many things about our temperament, who we're called to be, and to not be proud and full of self. Look not, verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Isn't that a tremendous statement? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. When you enter into a situation and you have concern, don't make your first priority yourself. Make your first priority others. Others, others. When there's a situation, others. If it's not sinful, if it's not unbiblical, if it's just a matter of me getting my way, I want to yield my way and let others have it. I don't want, I don't want to waste one moment in life fussing over things that don't matter in light of eternity. Now, we'll take a stand for truth. We'll take a stand for obviously for being correct when it comes to the Word of God. But there's so many times when people are fussing and feuding over things that are so unnecessary. Let nothing be done to strike. We make out of ourselves, we make ourselves the center. We make ourselves the person who should have their way. 
We say things like this, I deserve it, I'm the oldest. We say things like this, I've worked the hardest. We say things like that, I've given the most, or I have this, or I have that. Whoa! Drop that nonsense at the door. Lose that. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to, be, you're going to lose your ability to influence and your effect with people when you develop that attitude. What if I walked in or drove in tomorrow at the church and there was something that needed to be corrected or something that needed to be fixed, and I said, well, that's not my, I'm the, don't, doesn't that problem know who I am? I'm the pastor. Doesn't that clogged toilet know who I am? I can walk by it and walk by it and walk by it. You know what it'll still continue to be? So what do we do? Call Brother Scott. He does a great job. Thank you, Brother Scott. No, I, I make an attempt at it at first, right? I figure it out. Same thing for you. There's none of us when we, as we're traveling through life. Until the Lord calls us home, we should be living for others and be mindful of others. This would be a really great principle for your home. A lot of times in our homes, we fuss and we butt heads and we squabble just simply because we will not yield our way. I want my way. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do it when I want to do it. That's not what I like. Hold on. Again, if it's not unbiblical, if it's not a thing of sinfulness or anything like that, who cares? Do you think it's going to matter one minute, one second after you draw your last breath, that stuff that you were fussing over? In light of eternity, we look at stuff totally different. We say, this is really not that big of a deal. Go ahead. Have at it. Lowliness of mind. Not looking at self. This is this, I want you to look over real quick, if you would, please. Verse 21. When the Apostle Paul is talking about Timothy, this is a statement that he makes. Remember now what verse 4 says. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also in the things of others. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Hey, before you begin to feel sorry for yourself that, you know, you're super Christian like the Apostle Paul and you care for others and nobody else does, just so you know, Paul felt the same way. Paul said, I got nobody with the exception of Timothy who really gets it. Everybody's interested in their own stuff. And you know what? I find in this generation, because we have so much stuff, we have stuff upon stuff, don't we? We have so much stuff, we have a garage sale every 12 months to get rid of stuff to make room for more stuff. Stuff. If it's not our garage sale, we got Facebook Marketplace and places to sell our stuff so we can find more stuff, right? And you know what happens with stuff? Like the Lord told Timothy about the soldier who gets entangled in the affairs of this world. It's not that they're necessarily wrong or sinful, it's just that we get entangled in them. And we're not able to be as free as we would like to be and be the liberty we'd like to have in our life to serve the Lord when we just have too much stuff going on. And it's so much easier when it's our stuff to be more mindful of that, right? Me, mine. What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Look, Paul was dealing with the same thing. You know why? Because people are people. Whether they wear sandals and walk on Roman roads or they, well, we're still wearing sandals, aren't we, huh? You're just driving on Indiana roads. Let's go back to the Roman roads, amen? Yeah. Yeah. We have the same, the same flesh. We have the same uh, drawn back to that same thing about what? Me. Me. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind allow. Get the Lord's mind in this. See the pattern of his behavior. See this in verse 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Very simply put, that's not a complicated verse. It seems like it a little bit, but it's just saying this. That if you had said to Jesus, you're God, he would have said, that's a true statement. Not robbery. It's not robbery. Not diminishing God to say to Jesus, you're God. Equal. Jesus is God. Amen. That's the deity of Christ. So, hold on a second. We talked a moment ago about coming in and saying, don't they know who I am? Don't they know what I've done? I shouldn't have to do that. Why would I be expected to do that? Look at who God is. Look at who Christ is. Christ is God, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, would have no problem with you saying that he is God. Look what he did, verse 7, but made himself of no what? Reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. He was so obedient and so humbled by this that the Bible says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Why? Because Jesus humbled himself. Listen to this, and this is the application of our hearts. Jesus humbled himself and was obedient to the will of God. And then came recognition, and then came honor, and then came notoriety. When you and I humble ourselves to be obedient to the will of God, and God's will is accomplished in our life, whether it be here or there, there will be an honoring and a recognition by the one who knows everything, and that's the Lord. You think, well, I'm not getting any attention for this right now. Stop that. Remove that. Get that out of your life and just say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be humble. I want to be a servant. I want to look to others' needs. I want to look to get the gospel to others. I want to look to live the gospel for others. I desire that Christ would be exalted in my life. I desire whether in life or in death and persecution, whatever it may be, I want every essence of my life to reflect him. If he would become a servant, if he would humble himself and make himself of no reputation, then why in the world would we seek to establish ourselves? Look at who I am. Look at what I have done. You should recognize me for that. And I believe that people should recognize the accomplishments of others, but the heart of the person whom the Lord has used should be humbled and should be sincere and should be meek in recognizing that it's the Lord that's done those things and it was for the Lord that they did those things. No room for pride and ego. Pride and ego in the Lord's house creates problems. Creates problems. We need to be humble, all of us. And I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to all of us. We need to be humble under the hand of a mighty God. We all need to recognize who it is that saved us and called us and directed us and gives us our directions and our challenges and our tasks that are at hand. The Bible says here in verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Give me 10 minutes and I'll give you the message. Wherefore, all right, with all that in mind, talking about being like-minded, talking about being unified in heart and mind and soul and being given the beautiful example of Jesus who humbled himself and became obedient under the death of the cross. And if you've, if you've experienced any consolation, if you've experienced any love, if you've experienced any fellowship, if you've got any of that going on in your life, then reflect that. Look at the pattern that you see in Jesus. And now here's the directions. Here's some specific, if you will, directives that are given to these people. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, so they have a history of being what? Obedient. That's a positive. As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Doesn't that make us happy when we have people who we're leading when they're obedient, not just when we're around? Children, you want to make your parents happy? Obey in their presence and obey when they're out of the room. Let them hear that. Let them know that about you. You want to make our Lord happy? Let's be obedient to him. Let's simply take him at his word. Let's walk out and operate in faith and be obedient. The apostle Paul says you've been obedient. It's a testimony that's been established with you, not as in my presence only, not just when I'm with you, but how much more in my absence. You have blossomed, you have grown, you've developed. And then he says to them, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not a verse that's telling us that we can lose our salvation and that we're to work it out so that we'll have it. Listen, salvation is by grace. If you have, better yet, if Jesus has you, then you're secure and you're sealed. How do I get that? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must look at all things, Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. We don't take one verse and say from that we create a whole doctrine there. You have something. When you got saved, you were born again. You were born into God's family. And when you're born into God's family, you have something. You have everlasting, eternal life. And nobody can take that away from you. Aren't you glad about that this evening, to know that? That changes everything, doesn't it, to know that? Yeah. So what's he saying here? In the context, what he's saying to them is whether I'm around or I'm not around, you need to continue to do something. You need to continue to work out. You need to continue to grow, develop, take that salvation that you have and put it in a very respectful, reverential way. You need to put it to work and you need to let the Lord continue to develop you and bring you along. Why would it be with fear and trembling? 
Well, listen, bud, it's a fearful and a, a, a dreadful potential thing to stand before an angry master. You're going to sit someday or stand someday before the Lord Jesus Christ as a believer, and there's going to be a recognition of your life in Christ, and that ought to make us all do this. I know Hollywood, Hollywood has presented God to be some nice old man who's, you know, uh, got some kind of approach towards things. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a righteous God. Our God is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and he is supreme. And I assure you, when we stand before him, there will be no joking around. And that is something, young person, that is something that ought to motivate you. That is something that ought to affect how you handle what you've been given. There's a parable, and in that parable it references what people knew and what people had and how the Lord looked at them in accordance to their understanding. And I'm telling you tonight, the majority of us have a very good understanding of who the Lord is and what the Lord wants for our life. We need to follow that. We need to allow that to be worked out. We need to allow that to be developed and brought along in our life. It's also a fearful thing when we consider the consequence and the cost of sin and temptation in our life. But it ought to move us. The Bible says when somebody else falls, we ought to do something. We ought to take heed lest ye what? Fall. That could be any of us. That could be me. That could be you. And so we're careful in this business of our salvation. We're understanding of what we have. We're active in it. We want it to be developed. We want it to be growing and growing in our life. Not only were they told that on their own, in the absence of the Apostle Paul, he said that they were to work out their what? Their own salvation. Let me put it just very practic practically this way. That's your salvation, not mine. So preacher, what do you mean? It's a common salvation. Yes, it is. It's a common salvation in what the Lord has done for us collectively. But as individuals, it is your own salvation. It was your own new birth. It was your own new creation. That's yours. There's an expectancy now from you because of what the Lord has done for you, what he's done for me. That's mine. Well, we rejoice in that. But we need to take ownership of that. I remember as a young adult listening all those years in church and hearing all these things and all that stuff just kind of being there and a part of my life in the orbit, so to speak, of my life. But then all of a sudden one day it just kind of, I don't know what it was, but a sermon or something that piqued my interest or caught my thought and brought my heart and my mind into captivity that, hey, this is my race to run. This is mine. This is my own salvation. This isn't my pastors. This isn't my youth pastors. This isn't my parents. This is my life in Christ. This is my walk. This is my growth. These are my opportunities. These are the works that he established for me to walk in. Boy, you don't want to miss that. We don't want to lose out on those opportunities that the Lord has given to us. Now, I want you to notice here very quickly, for it is God, verse 13, which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Who is it that's working in me? Who is it? Here, I'm 50 years old now. Now, almost 30 years. Who is it that has given me the will or the, have been, has been that emphasis behind it? Who is it that has given me the strength to do these things? I wouldn't do these things in and of myself. It's God. It's God that's working in me. And so the Apostle Paul is telling them, you continue to obey as you have, and you continue to yield, and you continue to be affected by the will of God, by the directive of God, by the energy of God. That's why we make decisions for the Lord. That's why we allow the Lord to do inspection in our life. Well, when the Spirit is moving, when the Spirit is stirring in our life, we're sensitive to that because it's the Lord. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have prayed in the privacy of my office or here on this property somewhere, and I've said, Lord, I need energy. Lord, help me. Give me strength. But Lord, won't that give me desire to desire it? Has there ever been a time in your life in Christ where you did not necessarily desire the things of the Lord like you should? Of course. Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt faint and weary and you needed strength, you needed the Lord to come along and to help you, those that that's his department, both to will and to do his good pleasure? 
That's a big deal, man, when God is stirring in your heart. It's a big deal when the Lord is leading you into fruitful paths. Who? Creator God! Who came to this earth and made himself of no reputation. Not only did he redeem me, but he lives within me. The Spirit of God moving me and stirring me to love others, to comfort others, to bring consolation to others, to bring encouragement to others. Who is it that's doing that? It's God. Boy, don't fight against that. Yield. Hey, as the songwriter put it, as we see it in the example of the prophet in the Old Testament, hey, thou art the potter. I'm the clay. Make me the vessel that you want me to be. Don't fight against that. Yield. Be obedient. Do all things, verse 14, and I'll wrap it up. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Remember, we're looking at the unity and the, the heart of the servant, having the right mind, the mind of Christ, not doing it for self, exploitation or to be promoted or to receive that glory, not looking after what my, my stuff, but looking unto others reflecting that love and the comfort and the consolation that Christ has brought into my life, letting that be that which I serve by and that which I'm you know, oh, directed by. And then the Bible says something, something that I sometimes struggle with. Because I know who I'm supposed to be. I recognize the Lord empowering me. But sometimes I do those things with murmuring and disputings. How many of you could say there have been times when I've done, been who I'm supposed to be, I've done what I'm supposed to do, but I've kind of done it begrudgingly. I've kind of done it with murmurings and disputings. Murmurings, 14 times we see, depending on how you count them, 10 to 14, whatever list you would compile with Israel, they murmured. Their first issue of murmuring was when they got up against the Red Sea and they thought for sure they were going to get wiped out, and they began to murmur, murmur, murmur. They did not see how God could see them through. They murmured about the food. They murmured about the collection of the food. They murmured about water. They murmured about bitter water. I think perhaps one of the greatest sins of the faithful servant of God can be, can be found in that verse right there. Do all things without. I have been convicted. I have watched different folks in our church that have gone through unbelievable trial. And I've watched as they've done those things and endured those things without murmurings and disputings. And I'm convicted, and there are times when I'm doing something that I'm supposed to do. But there's that little bit of a questioning. Right, why do I have to do it? What about so-and-so? Kind of like that prophet who said, I'm the only one who hasn't been his knee. And the Lord said, hey, knucklehead, there's thousands that haven't. You're not the only one, Right? They call that having a pity party. Now, don't judge me, because you've probably done the same thing before. Hey, ladies, have you ever cooked a dinner for everybody that you love and that you enjoy cooking the dinner for, but you've had a busy day, you've had a hectic day, and you thought to yourself, huh, I wonder if they're going to like it. What are they going to say about it? Have you ever put it out there and your husband tasted it and said, hmm, I think it needs more salt? I have a bad habit sometimes of saying, how did you make this? Because this is fantastic. Make it like this every time. Now, I don't mean anything by that. What I mean by that is this is, boy, this is the most phenomenal meal I've ever had. You've made it the, most, the best way. Now, here's how my wife hears it. My wife hears it, that every time I've made it before, it was subpar. <laughs> right? And now you're telling me that I got it right finally after 30 years here of cooking this dish, right? That's not what I mean. Right? But that's kind of how it comes out. You know, that illustration of that clogged toilet. I can go in there and change that toilet and think to myself, why in the world after all these years am I still having to, I don't mind doing it and I'll do it because it needs to be done, but why in the world after all these years am I unclogging toilets? And then the Holy Spirit says, because it's what I've given you to do. Serve. Serve. Don't complain about it. You know what happens when we complain or we dispute those things that come into our life that the Lord's called us to do? When, we, when we're frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. Everybody gets, we, we, we rob the joy of the moment. 
we take away from it. And oftentimes the very thing that we, the Lord was going to use to bring joy into our life, we grumble and we gripe or we fuss over the thing. What's the sense in it? Do all things. So this church in Philippi, hey, be like-minded. Serve the Lord. Be like Jesus and be humble. And in all things, make sure you do something. Be who you're supposed to be. Think how you're supposed to be. And then do what you're called to do without murmurings and disputings. If you watch the children of Israel, you'll see something, and I've got to close. You'll watch they build up. They get in the habit, a consistent pattern of murmuring and griping every time they were faced with a challenging situation, every time they went up against something that was contrary to what they wanted. You see, they had the same problem we do. They sought themselves and not others. It was always about the individual. They're always about them and their perspective, right? They started out griping at the Red Sea, and they griped about the food, and they griped about the water, and then it came down to their final murmuring, so to speak. And you know what it was? When it was time to go into the promised land. You see, they had done something. They developed a consistent pattern of doing what God told them to do, but not doing it the right way, with the right attitude. So when it came to that big task, 12 men went to spy in Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? 10 were bad and 2 were good. Some saw what? Giants. And they came back and the murmuring people who had developed a habit of murmuring and disputing against the will of God. It's like when your parents tell you to go and clean your bedroom, young person, and you gripe about it. Because that's going to keep you from having to clean your room. And if you're a parent and you let your child get out of cleaning their room because they gripe about it, shame on you. If you've got to go in there and sit on a stool, if you've got to go in there and sit on their bed and watch them, teach them that you can't murmur and to complain and get out of stuff, right? It doesn't work that way. All the kids are going, oh man, preacher, that's a letdown, right? <laughs> oh, it's life. But they had learned doing it. Eventually they got where God wanted them to go. It's just how they got there. And they robbed themselves of joy. They created stress in their life. And when they really needed to do what they were supposed to do, they missed out. The Bible says that their hearts were hardened. They rebelled against God because of fear. And they, there was that generation that didn't enter in, right? And they died off in the wilderness. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And the Bible says in verse 15, that ye may be, what? Blameless. So the implication there is that I can do the things that the Lord's called me to do, but if I don't do them the right way, I can create an air and an atmosphere around me that's not blameless. Well, there's a level of conviction that comes when I think of that. I want to not just do what the Lord's called me to do. I want to do it in His energy, in His strength, recognize it, and I want to do it with the right attitude. I want to leave that murmuring and that disputing out of it. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the book of Philippians, Lord, bringing us to this point of what kind of servants we're called to be. Now, Lord, we desire that you'd help us. Our hands, heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. May I ask this evening, you'd say, Preacher, boy, there was something tonight, maybe this morning in the message, here in the second chapter, in the conclusion of the first chapter of Philippians that the Lord would use in my life. Maybe it's an inspection of your heart. Maybe it's an inspection of your attitude. I don't know what it may be. I'm trusting that the Lord will take His Word and it will blossom and grow in your heart into a decision that will bring, produce fruit in your life. If you're here this evening, say, Preacher, there was something somewhere in that for me tonight and the Lord's dealing with my heart. Would you lift your hand, anybody like that? Many hands tonight. That's the moving of the Lord. But it's the Lord that does both to what? To will and to do. That's God moving. Don't push God away. When God stirs your heart, when God nudges you, you let him bring you along. He's a good shepherd. He'll bring you into green pastures and he'll lead you by still waters. He's a perfect gentleman. He'll lead you if you'll follow him. Here in just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. I'll ask our pianist to play. Let's have a time of invitation. We're going to go on from this. We have other things planned tonight. But here right now in this moment, let's do business with the Lord. Let's stand up. Can we please stand up and... We're not looking to see who's moving. We're just asking the Lord to move in our heart and our life. Our pianist is playing. Here's an opportunity for you to join others who have stepped out. Come now. We'll not drag it out. We'll not go along in this. Maybe the Lord's dealing with you about your attitude. Maybe as the Word of God can, it cuts us open, right? And it reveals the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It shows us where we're out of line. Maybe there has been some, some doing of right things, but not without murmuring and disputing.